let's talk about two-handed weapons on horseback with my friend Zach Evans. Hello. Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiator and here is Zach Evans. If you don't know him, he's got his own channel linked straight below and Zach's speciality is combat on horseback um, and jousting, most famously perhaps, but also we reenact together, we do Tewkesbury together, and so you might, if you follow my channel or Zach's, have seen us collaborate in the past. So Zach was coming over here anyway tonight, and I said, Zach, do you want to film a video? And he said, what about? And I said, well, funnily enough, I was looking at a manuscript uh, yesterday, trying to research something else, and I noticed something which I've seen in art a number of times before, and that is a group of people on horseback with long swords, using them two-handed. Now, this, <laughs> this to me is something that kind of is a little bit wacky, because I think about how do you control a horse, how do you use your sword, um, does it make any sense to use a longsword two-handed on horseback? And you can also extrapolate that to other two-handed weapons used on horseback, yeah. such as glaives. Yeah. So I know that in China, um, also in Japan with the Naginata, sometimes uh, if we go back, certain types of lance were used two-handed in late Roman era. So what are your thoughts about two-handed weapons used on horseback? And have you ever tried it? So I've never tried it but I have seen it done. Right. Um, I used to train with Jason Kingsley. Oh yeah. And um, he was uh, at one point trialing that out. So he was able to do it. Yeah. Um, I've seen other people do it. I haven't done it. And I don't think most people did. Right, uh, so what, what, was, what was he doing? Was he using a long sword from horseback? Yes. Yeah. What to like ch chop cabbages yep. and that, so Against skeletons. Targets. Right. Yeah, yeah. So the, Real thing that well, <laughs> give you a yeah, long sword. Absolutely. Um, the long sword is obviously used both on horseback and on foot. Mm. And if you're ever a cavalryman in the Middle Ages, then you need to be aware that you might be asked to dismount. So having a long sword is going to be useful mm. in that um, in that regard. Also, having a longer handle on the long sword gives you loads of options even if you're not going to use it two-handed. Mm. Um, and we see that in the manuals as well, you know, moving it so that you're holding down by the pommel. To get more reach. To get more reach, yeah. being able to hold it out so that you have more reach with the point. All of those things are shown as well, um, as well as rarely using it two-handed. Um, the thing about using it two-handed is that the actual use of the sword in that sense isn't the hard part. Mm. It's the controlling of the horse. Yeah, and that's the bit that I don't know anything about yeah. at all. And it's also a case that actually, in that regard, if your horse isn't up to snuff, even if you're a great rider, then okay. that's going to mess you up as well. Okay. Because um, the first thing that you learn to control when you're riding a horse is with your hands, if I give the sword back to yep. you. So when you first start, you tend to think horse is like a car. Mm. You've got the steering wheel and that's the reins and then you've got the pedals and that's the feet. Yeah. Right. Um, that is completely not the case. As, um, <laughs> if you play Bannerlord, then it is like driving a car. Yeah, okay because the horse doesn't have its own brain, but of course no. horses do have their own brains and they exactly. do things you don't want them to do. And Yeah, yeah. so um, riding a horse is a lot like a conversation. Yeah. And in a conversation, there's a lot more than just what you're saying. You say things in your posture and mm. uh, um, in all sorts of different ways. So riding a horse, you can give the same information to the horse mm. in lots of different ways not just using the reins and not just uh, using the, you know, by kicking. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest ways that you can do that is through the seat. So the way okay. that you sit on the horse. So that is a great way of um, controlling the horse. And in many ways, it's one of the more um, uh, deeper communications because your entire weight is a lot more effective than just tweaks with the hand. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as a non-horse person, I've read in books people referring to steering, well, steering the horse, controlling the horse yeah. with the knees. Yeah. Is that right? 
Yes, you can do. Basically, okay. any point where you are touching the horse yeah. can be a way of communicating. Okay. Um, so if you are um, if you are using two hands on a weapon, however that may be, any other contact with the horse is going to be a communication with it. Mm. If you're not skilled at that, then the communications that you give when you're focusing on something else mm. may well go wrong. Yeah. So this would be my follow-up question. So anybody can learn to ride with no hands, essentially. Yeah. Just in, I mean, you can ride a bicycle with no hands, but yeah. you can ride a horse because clearly the horse can, unlike a bicycle, it can balance itself, yeah. it can walk That's itself. Right. You're just sitting on its back. And, and um, there's deep horse archer um, yeah. traditions all around the world. So. Yeah, so that was going to be my next question is that, so clearly you can sit on a horse without holding any reins yeah. and, and it will ride. Uh, and clearly you can steer it and control it. Is your, so this is my, I've, I've mentioned this in previous videos when I've been complaining about actually the game Bannerlord, which I used to play quite a lot. I've, I've um, gone off it a bit recently, but um, one thing that bothers me is that a person using both their hands on horseback, yeah. whether it's to shoot a bow as a yeah. horse archer or whether it's using a, like a glaive or whatever on horseback, can still ride with the mm. exact same level of skill and control as somebody who's having to hold the reins. Yeah. And that doesn't seem right to me. Do you think that someone can control a horse equally as well without any use of reins? A good rider on a good horse will do most of their communication without the reins. Okay. Um, the... The way that you communicate most of the things is through the seat and it's through the legs. Okay. The reins um, are there and you will be using them all the time, but it's not necessarily the main form of communication. Okay. Um, if a horse is, uh, we, we sometimes refer to a horse as being numb to the seat. Right. So... Um, that would be maybe um, a horse that has lived for you know 15 years in a riding school mm -hmm. and has had um, people who are not so well trained sitting on it. Okay. Um, it will have loads of cues coming through the seat. But it just ignores. And it ignores yeah. them. Right, okay. Because it's used to... So you need a quite sensitive horse then that is attuned to that style of... Yeah. Okay, so the next follow-up question, I guess this would probably be my last main question that I've got in my brain, mm. is let's say you've got a horse that's fantastically trained and you are fantastically trained at riding around and with your hands free. Okay, mm -hmm. so you've got your hands free horse, your hands free set horse, and you're now going to use weapons, whether it's shooting a bow, whether it's using a glaive, whether it's using a long sword like I saw in that manuscript. Yeah. Once you start doing those things, is that going to really mess up your communication with the horse? Um, yes. So when I talk about seat communication, a lot of that is to do with um, weight distribution on top of the horse's back. Yeah. So if you are throwing in big swings with a sword then that will change your weight distribution in a way mm. that is mm. um is not good you're going to start sending mm. cues that you didn't mean to to the horse yeah um which is why for a lot of um cavalry units in later history they really kind of reduce the amount of movement mm. um that we create from the waist down so the swings come from the shoulder. Okay. And once you get to the, um, the 19th century uh, and the 18th century, as you know, they're encouraging people to actually use the point of the sword well, and, um, and keep it... Um, I just happen to have a 19th yeah. century cavalry sword here. Um, moreover, not just to give a point and basically hold it static and let the horse yeah. deliver the point, but even with cuts, they tell you to basically lay the blade out. And I know you do this in skillet arms, yeah. chopping through cabbages and stuff, uh, to basically lay the blade out and let the momentum of the horse do yeah. it, to not actually swing the, horse, yeah. swing the sword. Now, interestingly, in the period cavalry um, manuals, the main reason they give for this is the the control of the horseman, the cavalryman. So not to overswing and hit the horse's head yeah. or uh, not to fall off your saddle because yeah. these are often not very experienced riders. Um, and also not to uh, sort of over 
hit the target. It's the same with yeah. uh, with thrusting. You basically, as soon as the point goes in, you want to be thinking about getting it out, like yeah. intent pegging. So it's actually it's more complicated to get the point out than to get it in. Yeah. Um, so they make a big effort of not putting more energy into the blow and just let the horse do it. So if can I yeah. grab the sword? So when you swing, as you know, if you reach and swing, yeah. you put the weight into Onto the leading stirrup. foot, yeah. right? So that weight then goes into the stirrup. But yeah. what that also does, because the stirrup is hanging from the saddle, is it pushes your heel into the side of the horse. Right. So if you reach and swing, then you're actually pushing the horse away from the target. Yeah, okay. So you're going to swipe and... Yeah. <laughs> and so you need to be completely in control of right. the weight distribution in order for any swing like that um, to not move your horse in the opposite way to what you actually want. It's super complicated really, isn't it? So, yeah. so uh, and I guess the final question therefore would be, so I think we've established that when you start using any weapon on horseback, perhaps not so much a bow because a bow is quite isolated. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, if you're riding with your lower body, essentially, all you're really doing is drawing and, and releasing. Yeah. You're not doing anything kind of jerky or sudden movements. Yeah. But as soon as you start swinging a weapon around, like a naginata, a glaive or a two-handed sword, you're going to be giving a lot of weird information to the horse, aren't you? So yeah, you're going to have absolutely. to train that a lot, I yes. think. Um, and I think... The reason, obviously, there's the manuscript, and you do occasionally see things like that. But the reason why you don't see it very often is because it didn't, it wasn't that useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you think about like the failure of that thing, if you accidentally move your horse in the wrong direction when you're shooting a bow, yeah, you're still a long distance away from your opponent. But if you're within striking distance, mm. then the failure if you fail to control your horse correctly, the consequences are a lot more severe. Yeah, and I mean, I, the final thing I would say as well is from, a, contr uh, from a, a weapon control point of view as well, one of the downsides to using a two-handed weapon from horseback is you actually reduce your reach. Yeah. So clearly, with a spear in one hand, you can reach further, either couched or extended, you can reach further than you could if you bring it into two hands a lot of the time. But with something like a sword, as soon as you've got both hands on the weapon and both shoulders attached to it, if I'm sitting on horseback, I can only reach that far Whereas one-handed, I can reach this far. So I can reach much further one-handed and I've got the advantage of being able to hold the reins as well uh, to give that extra bit of control. So it is completely normal throughout history to use swords, even long swords, to use them one-handed on horseback. And that's one of the great things about a long sword, of course, is that on foot, you can use it two-handed and mounted, you can use it one-handed. And it's not the most wieldy sword, but as we've established on horseback, often you just basically hold the blade out and hit yeah. with it, either with the point or the edge. So for that purpose, a large long sword can still do that. And to some extent, we'll probably do it with more force and energy than a one-handed sword in some cases. Um, so it was done. And some people do seem to, you know, particularly, you know, the samurai seem to have used uh, Naginata uh, two-handed and sometimes Yari two-handed on horseback. The uh, certain types of uh, like Sassanid uh, cavalry, I think, used lances two-handed, but I think that they were almost trotting. They weren't really yeah. riding fast. I think that's the theory. Um, so there were, but you know, there have been people in, in history who've used hand weapons, just putting horse archers aside, hand weapons two-handed on horseback. But overall, they're a minority, aren't they? Yeah. The vast absolutely. majority of people throughout history have used one-handed weapons on horseback, I think for the reasons that we've set yeah. out in this. Because ultimately, when you're fighting as a cavalryman, the most important thing is the control of the horse. Yes. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, great to have a horseman here because I've only ridden a handful of times in my entire life, so I know almost nothing about horses. Um, I'd like to rectify that one day. But um, Zach, thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, okay. Remember to check out Zach's channel down below. And if you've got experience, have you done this? Have you used two-handed weapons from horseback? I'm sure some of you out there watching this video might have done. What are your thoughts? Do you agree with what we've said? Do you disagree? Get posting in the comments. And if you've got follow-up questions for Zach or me, then uh, we might be happy to answer those as well. So thanks again to Zach. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Cheers, folks.
Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.